thanks, comrades, for uh, giving me the platform uh, to speak to you today. Um, I will be speaking about um, Palestine and the Arab Revolution um, with a special emphasis on, on Egypt. Um, the, the, the reason behind that is not only because it's the country that I come from um, and where I'm much more qualified and experienced to speak about, but also Egypt is the most populous uh, Arab nation with the biggest working class. And whenever we speak about Palestine, um, Egypt has to be part of this conversation because Jerusalem will not be liberated uh, except if Cairo uh, is liberated. Um, the Palestinian cause has always been a radicalizing and a revolutionizing uh, factor for Egyptian youth. Um, generation after generation of Egyptian activists, including myself, our gateway into politics and local dissent has been uh, via the Palestinian cause. Uh, usually, uh, people who are not familiar with the struggle in the Middle East um, or those who subscribe to right-wing uh, mainstream uh, uh, views would treat the Palestinian cause as the opium of the Arab people. They would perceive the Palestinians to be um, a thing that Arab regimes use in order to diffuse um, uh, public uh, interest in local politics into some outside enemy. And you must have heard, I mean, these arguments before. In addition to the fact that um, some tend to regard the struggle as, you know, you have the Palestinians supported by the their, their Arab states, versus uh, David, you know, who is this tiny state in the Middle East surrounded by vicious Arab neighbors who want to throw it into the sea. But the reality is, is, is very different uh, from that. Um, usually people, when they start expressing solidarity with the Palestinians, their actions of solidarity quickly turns into anti-local regime dissent. And this is why the Arab regimes, they fear the Palestinians. They regard the Palestinians as a source of instability, as a source of threat, and as a source of inspiration for their own Arab people to start rebelling and, and revolting. Uh, over domestic conditions. And I will give like a couple of or, or, or examples from the Egyptian situation. Uh, usually when we talk about 1968, um, this year of global revolt, people talk about uh, the French May, they talk about the college occupations in Europe, or they talk about the anti-Vietnam War uh, uh, movement in the US. But the Arab world itself also had its own 1968, which is not really uh, covered uh, quite well in history books. For example, in February 1968 and in November 1968, we had two waves of student rebellions that were the first student rebellions against the Nasserist regime uh, uh, in Egypt. And these rebellions were also joined by the working class, especially the February 1968 mass protests. Um, and 1968 in Egypt, these protests they, they started a chain reaction that went on and a social movement started to, to gather storm, which eventually led to the 1977 so-called bread uprising, when we had a two-day national uprising by the Egyptian working class and the students and the urban poor, 
that was put down brutally uh, by the Sadat regime. Um, and the trigger for that uprising were the elimination of subsidies from the basic consumer products um, that Egyptians live on, like bread. That's why it was called the bread uprising. Now, where does Palestine filter into this? The This social movement was spearheaded by left-wing activists who were all part of the so-called Gamayat Ansar Thawr al Palestinia on the Egyptian university campuses and outside, which translates into the societies of supporters of the Palestinian revolution. These were left wing activists who got radicalized by the Palestinian cause, and they were the ones who led uh, the social movement, which eventually turned into an uprising. And by the way, this was the first Arab Spring, which is also hardly documented because this uprising in Egypt um, was did spur a domino effect in the region. And, and you had similar uprisings at the time. For example, Tunisia in 1978, January 1978, witnessed an uprising by the trade unions you cannot also isolate the Iranian Revolution, which happened uh, uh, at that time, away from the regional radicalization that has been happening. Now, you fast forward to the first intifada in 1987, when Palestinians started uh, confronting uh, the Israeli occupation troops. And at the time, we didn't really have satellite TVs. You just had newspapers and the state TV. At the beginning, the state TV was transmitting those visuals of, of the confrontations in the occupied territories. But then the Minister of Information, Safwat Sharif, who is a former General Intelligence Service officer, a former Mukhabarat officer, who Mubarak has entrusted to run the Ministry of Information, he issued directives to the state TV to stop broadcasting images from the occupied territories and to decrease the coverage of whatever was happening in Palestine. Why? Because this triggered mass protests on the university campuses and in the professional syndicates that quickly turned into anti-regime dissent. Now, I, I joined university uh, as an undergraduate uh, uh, student in 1995, like in the mid 1990s. And at the time, Egypt was going through its, its first war on terror. And at the time, dissent was crushed from all shades, and there were no industrial actions. And the university campuses were always under siege from the police troops. Um, and you could not whisper Mubarak's name at the time. You could not even mention his family's name in protests. You could talk about the regime in an abstract sense. You can talk about the government. You can denounce a minister, but you cannot whisper Mubarak's name. Now, I want to give you a concrete example of a pro-Palestine protest that I personally took part in in 1999 to explain to you how the regional becomes the local right away. Uh, in 1999, as student activists on the campus, we, we decided to hold a pro-Palestine sit-in because this was the time when the Israelis were bombing southern Lebanon. So we decided that, you know, we're going to have a, a, a sit-in to protest uh, these assaults. Now, the sit-in started by chanting, obviously, pro-Palestine and pro-Lebanese resistance uh, uh, slogans. After a while, the focus of the protest started to shift into anti-US and anti-Israeli uh, uh, chants. After a while, the focus started to shift into wondering why isn't our government doing enough to help the Palestinians and the Lebanese? And then the shift started a few minutes later into 
why is our government that doesn't want to help the Palestinians and the Lebanese are actually exporting cement to Israel, which is being used to, to, to build settlements? Why is our government opening up an Israeli embassy in the heart of Cairo? Why is our government not expelling the U.S. ambassador uh, over uh, the support for Israel in these attacks? Few minutes later, as soon as the Central Security Forces troops, these are our paramilitary police troops, showed up and besieged the, the university, people started asking, why is our government that doesn't want to help the Palestinians, that's exporting cement to Israel, that's opening up an embassy for the Israelis in, in, in Cairo, is sending to our peaceful protest troops instead of sending those troops to help the Palestinians. And then with the first assault on protesters, the chant started to be against police brutality, against repression. And, and then there were discussions after the sit-in was over between the students. We, we were by the end discussing the Belharsia disease that's eating up the peasants in Upper Egypt in the South. We were discussing the housing crisis and these newly gated communities that were springing uh, uh, up on the outskirts of Cairo while the urban poor uh, are facing a housing crisis. So as you can see, the event started as a solidarity event with the Palestinians. It ended up discussing the housing crisis in Egypt and the situation of Egyptian farmers. So the regional becomes the local right away. Now, I will try to, to conclude um, this brief presentation by talking about like um, the most important example of this radicalization that, that the Palestinians uh, um, help to instigate when it comes to Egypt. And that is the 2011 uprising in Egypt. I mean, how did the uprising in Egypt actually happen? I gave you an example from the 1990s where you could not whisper Mubarak's name. But then suddenly, a decade later, Egyptians were toppling Hosni Mubarak. Now, this, how did we get from that point to this point? It was actually thanks to the Second Palestinian Intifada. The Second Palestinian Intifada, when it, when it broke out in September 2000, it created this domino effect where we saw the biggest protests in the history of the country since the 1977 uprising taking place. They started initially on the university campuses, then they spread to the professional syndicates. I mean here by the professional syndicates are the, the unions that unionize uh, lawyers, pharmacists, doctors, and historically, these professional syndicates enjoyed a relative independence compared to the blue collar trade unions that are completely dominated uh, by the state. Um, and this wave of protests that happened, how did, how did they start? People were seeing visuals of Palestinian kids taking on Israeli tanks in Gaza and in the West Bank, and they were transmitted visually to all Egyptian homes via Al Jazeera at the time and the rise of the satellite TV stations. So people were drawing parallels right away. They were thinking if those Palestinian kids can take on the Israelis, uh, the Israeli tanks, then we can take on Mubarak's police. Uh, People always draw parallels all the time. So when the protest started in 2000, they were crushed by the police after a week. The first week of October, uh, the police rounded up uh, hundreds of student activists and thousands of protesters, and the protest died down relatively. But then they were reignited once again in April 2002, uh, that was dubbed the Cairo University Intifada, Intifada Gamat Qahira at the time. 
And that's when the Cairo University students for two days, they battled the riot police in the Bain Sarayat neighborhood in Giza that surrounds uh, Cairo University in scenes that we actually saw also a decade later when the revolution happened. And I'm talking here about scenes that the anti-riot police uh, armored vehicles trying to run over protesters, uh, tear gas, uh, rubber bullets, and live ammunition. And this was the first time in my life that I would hear thousands uh, chanting against Hosni Mubarak in 2002. They were chanting Hosni Mubarak, Zayi Sharon, Nafs al wa Nafs al Hosni Mubarak is just like Sharon. He's the same color. He's the same figure. The protests were crushed brutally, but then they reignited once again with the invasion of Iraq in 2003. In March 2003, you had running battles for two days where protesters took over Tahrir Square in a dress rehearsal for what was going to happen a decade later with the revolution. And people tore down the National Democratic Party. This was Mubarak's ruling uh, party. They tore down its banners. They burned down Mubarak's posters in Tahrir Square. They battled the right police, which used uh, bird shots, rubber bullets, um, water cannons, and protesters were very close to storming the U.S. embassy, but they were fought back by the police uh, at the time. All of these regional mobilizations that happened in, in those first three years of the Intifada, they created for us a margin where we could maneuver and it's not a coincidence that the Kifaya movement, which Kifaya is Arabic for enough, and this was the umbrella United Front movement against Mubarak, it started in 2004. And because basically the pro-Palestine movement helped us to create this margin and to revive street politics. And if you look at the pictures of um, the organizers of Kifaya who held Kifaya's first protest, they were all the pro-Palestine solidarity activists from the previous years. Now, Kifaya took on Mubarak and mobilized for two years in the streets of Cairo. They revived street dissent. But Kifaya never really mobilized more than a few hundreds and sometimes a handful of protesters. But at the same time, Kifaya's uh, media strategy rested on that we will spread those visuals of dissent to millions of Egyptians. So as to normalize the idea that you can actually take on Hosni Mubarak. Uh, and after two years, you had the industrial actions uh, 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 started to spring up in Egypt in December 2006. That's when 3,000 female garment workers from the Ghazl al-Mahalla factory in the heart of the Nile Delta, they went on strike and then they started touring the factory compound and they were chanting, like, where are the men? Here we are, the women, which is a football chant that they have modified. And basically, they, they shamed their male colleagues into action. That's when the entire textile mill of 22,000 uh, uh, labor force went on strike and occupied the mill for three days and they managed to score victory. Once they scored victory, this triggered a domino effect and it launched the winter of labor discontent in Egypt where all of the textile sector uh, uh, factories went on strike demanding the same gains as Ghazal Mahalla. And then it, the militancy started spilling over the other industrial sectors and the social movement uh, uh, kept on escalating until we reached the 2011 uh, uh, uprising. Now, I recall uh, that I was asking the industrial uh, organizers in 2007 and 2008 
later, like, where were you when we were protesting with Kifaya in downtown Cairo? And they told me at the time that we were in front of our TV screens watching those crazy kids of Kifaya burning Mubarak's posters in Tahrir Square. And we were looking at one another with disbelief, but we started drawing parallels. If these kids can take on Hosni Mubarak, we can take on Gibali. Gibali was the CEO of Ghazl al-Mahalla at the time. So as you can see, comrades, that's how the domino effect always plays in, in, in when it comes to social struggle. Unless you are part of the elite and you have a direct interest in the status quo, unless you are like that, then you have to ask yourself, uh, why are not people revolting? Why are they not revolting? When you walk in the streets and you see around you people who are oppressed by the system, why are they not revolting? The, the point is, these revolutionary ideas, they cross everyone's mind almost every day, but they get scoffed because they are crazy. They are against the common sense that you've been brought up into. The media tells you that these things never happen. And if they happen, they will always fail. But once you start seeing that there are other people like yourself somewhere else have started putting these crazy ideas into action and that it worked, that's when these crazy ideas, they become normalized. They become mainstream. And that's how people start revolting. In the same way that when you had the Bolshevik revolution in 1917, how did it trigger all of these European revolutions, for example, at the time? And by the way, it, its extent and reverberations went outside Europe also. It's just because you send the message that these insane ideas that are in your head, they are not insane. Actually, they are normal and they are applicable and they are doable. That's what the Palestinian cause actually does to the Arab people. And probably I'll conclude here, I'll, I'll stop here and uh, we can open the floor for discussion.